Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz, and with me today is a very special guest. He is a legendary disc jockey from WPLJ in New York, and of course, a world-famous WWF announcer, backstage interviewer, extraordinaire, the master of the voiceover, Mr. Todd Pettengill. Todd, welcome to the two-man power <laughs> Thank trip. Thank you. I better not screw it up now after that intro, right? <laughs> so how's everything going? What's going on in your world? Uh, you know, trying to get back to normal, just like everybody else with this pandemic. But uh, I think slowly but surely things are beginning to creep back and, uh, you know, we're climbing out of it together. Absolutely. So what have you been up to as far as work wise? Is it still doing radio show? Like, what have you been up to? Uh, not doing the radio anymore. Um, I own a recording studio, uh, just outside of Austin, Texas. And, uh, so I've been working on that and producing albums and videos and that kind of thing, uh, keeping busy and now, you know, putting my foot back into the wrestling world. Very cool. So no longer a Jersey guy, I guess. No, no. Moved, uh, moved out of uh, New Jersey a few years ago. And, uh, I mean, I spent a long time there, but so I guess you're always technically considered a Jersey guy. I spent most of my life there. Uh, longer than ever anywhere else. Um, so I will always consider myself a Jersey guy, but uh, I do not miss the taxes in New Jersey or the traffic. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, when as you get a little older, you're not there yet, but you have to start thinking about retiring and how far your money will go. And it definitely goes further in Texas. See, I'm a Jersey guy right now. The taxes are horrible. And the, now with the traffic, because I'm right by the Jersey Shore, I'm over by Asbury Park, with the traffic is getting crazy. Yeah, because I'm sure a lot of people have gone down to the shore during this pandemic, right? Yep. Now they're starting to pack the beaches now, or yep, at least try to. Yeah. Now, as far as you coming back to WWE and being a part of NXT, what's that like? Because I know last year you were part of the uh, the In Your House video when you did the package and stuff. So what's it kind of like coming back to the world of wrestling at WWE? It's fun. I mean, I stayed in touch with a lot of people, uh, obviously, but last year we did it uh, virtually. So I just recorded stuff from my studio here in Texas and they used it. But to be back live is going to be fun. I mean, there's nothing like that live energy and seeing everybody again. So I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. It's, uh, it's you know, you want to say the same but different. Um, a lot of the people behind the scenes are still folks that I remember from my time there, but you know, there's a, a bunch of new people as well. And that's always exciting to work with new people. And, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. As far as kind of how you got back, how does that connection happen? Is, is that like a triple H thing? Who reached out to you and, and get you back in the fold? Uh, yeah, well, triple H, uh, reached out, as you know, um, when I left, I recommended, uh, Michael Cole. Uh, so he and I are, obviously been very good friends. He was my news guy at, uh, when I did a radio show in Albany. And um, when I was in New York at PLJ, he was doing radio at CBS. And when it came time for me to sort of step aside because I was using all my vacation time for pay-per-views, it was fine until we added a monthly pay-per-view. And then I basically didn't have any vacation for six years. So we left on great terms. I brought in Michael. He and I still stay in touch. Uh, so that, you know, it seemed like a natural fit within your house. Um, like it or not, I, I seem to be associated within your house from back in the day. And it's a good thing for me. Uh, it was a blast to do and now to recreate it and modernize it, uh, you know, as a takeover, I, I think is, is going to be awesome. Very cool. Like to see, cause Michael Cole, you know, still there 20 plus years later. So it's funny. He's like your predecessor. He just followed right in your footsteps and, and kept going. And obviously he's the, one of the top dogs out there. A good recommendation, right? I mean, yeah. that's got to say something. Yeah, you got to get a percentage of that, right? If you, I mean, you would think, <laughs> right? Yeah. But that's pretty cool, though. If you think about, like, there's still some people, like, obviously Kevin Dunn, maybe he just doesn't do too much of NXT, but he's still around. He was around, you know, the voice of God, if you will, Kevin Dunn. He, um, Triple H. I know he yep. was a little bit later in your state, but Triple H is, is running things there. So the more things change, the more things stay the same. Yeah. No, that's very true, and in a lot of businesses as well. And, um, you know, Triple H and I had a, a great relationship when uh, when I was there. And he remembered me and said, hey, this might be fun to, you know, have you come in and do. So I said, more than happy to do it. You like being associated with In Your House? 
Yeah, I mean, it's better to be associated with prison, um, you know, or, or, or something that's not going to work, right? It's a positive thing. It's nostalgic. Uh, it was one of those pay-per-views that really seemed to have an impact on fans. So, yeah, why not, man? There's certainly worse things you could be associated with, right? Absolutely. What's been like the buzz like for you? Have you been getting a lot of positive feedback as far as you coming back and being a part of NXT and being a part of their in your house special, the takeover special? Really have. Um, I'm always amazed that wrestling fans, you know, love you or hate you. They remember you. And that's not, you know, you can't say that about a lot of sports or entertainment uh, things. I guess if, you know, you make a movie, people re recognize you and remember you. But to think I've been gone for 20 some odd years from that world and they still remember and uh, some of them have an affinity. Others don't, which is the good with the bad, you know. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I think it's awesome to have that brand recognition. Um, it means I guess I did something right back in the day. And uh, I still have fun doing it. And I think if you can bring something fresh to it, it shouldn't all be about nostalgia. So if you're still confident, if you're still comfortable in front of the camera, if you still feel like you have something to say, then I think it makes sense. Uh, if I was sort of doddering in there and had no clue where I was or what was going on, I'd say, eh, probably not a good idea just for nostalgic sake. But this seems to uh, to work out great. And the, the response overall has been uh, pretty positive. It looks like you haven't aged either, which is a good thing, right? You look well, exactly the same almost. <laughs> don't look too closely. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny it's like wow it's todd bengale which is great for them it's like he looks almost exactly the same let's just use him for our takeover special or you know in your house that's funny yeah i mean a lot of wrinkles and bourbon under the bridge but other than that i guess uh, things are basically the same with like nxt and and the takeover specials and then bring it back in your house do you watch like the current wrestling and the current product I watch some. I've stayed in touch over the years. There'll be times where I'll jump in and then jump out, but certainly not as consistently as you do when you're working there. Um, you know, with all the other stuff that I had going on, it's a little difficult to, to stay in touch. But what, now that I'm immersed in it again, I definitely have been watching and, and learning storylines and trying to keep up. And, you know, it's, a, it's basically like doing your research, right? It's what, when, you're, when you know you're going to be involved, you better know what the heck you're talking about. Yes. Do you think that current wrestling has changed a lot since you're, are you thinking it's still kind of the same, just the general thing? I'm not sure it's changed a lot. I think we've changed a lot as an audience. Uh, the audience expects a lot more. Uh, they're used to, you know, social media now where, where nothing is private, everything is shared and you have access to absolutely everything with everyone so that's changed the actual product itself has always been fantastic production wise it it remains one of the top produced uh genres i think on television and a lot of that is you know thanks to kevin and vince obviously and the staff that you know maintains that level but yeah i don't think wrestling so much has changed but our perception of it has uh, and that's an interesting thing to try to try to do when you're producing content is remember that people have so much more access and, and they want so much more, need so much more and have access to so much more. It sort of changes how people watch. When you look at like the current landscape, do you think like, wow, the guys are smaller today or, you know, it's a different approach today? Because it does seem like especially in your era, those guys are larger than life. Even like Duke the Dumpster Dross, he's like 6'7", and, and Henry Godwin, and you know all those, Sid and Diesel, and Andres, like all those monsters. You think it's changed a bit today, a little, little bit more focused on the smaller guys? It may have. Um, speed may have may be more of a thing than it was back then. That was, you're, you're right. I mean, when I was there, the, these guys were massive. Um you know, the giant Gonzalez who used to chase me around the Mania studio. Um, <laughs> you know, Sid was a monster. Diesel, as you mentioned, all these guys, Undertaker. Um, and now maybe maybe the focus has switched a little bit to speed. But listen, there's still some massive guys in both the WWE and NXT. So uh, it, maybe it's a blending. I'm not sure if it's that's just where the athleticism is coming from nowadays. Um, 
but it's it's one of those things right that everything evolves and I, I don't really have an answer to that except to say I wouldn't step in a ring with any, any of them for any reason. <laughs> I, I got you. As far as like this takeover special, which is coming up and being a part of NXT, do they say like exactly what you're going to be doing or you kind of just going in, you're, you're just ready for anything? Yeah, I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. Um, I know there's a press conference that I'm a part of and I'm, hosting the event what that means i don't know i guess they'll tell me when i get there uh, that's why i'm trying to prepare as much as i can know as much as i can going in because uh you know i think they're sort of finding a place for me for this so whatever that role is i'm happy to fill it does that make you nervous at all like oh this is you know this is the brave new world if you will yeah no i mean i i've been doing this a long time um, both on camera and behind the mic. So I'm fairly comfortable with that aspect of it. It's just wanting to do it correctly and put the guys over and, and, you know, tell the right story and, uh, th those sorts of things. Cause you know, when you're doing television, you're doing it the same for any product, right? Just the content is different. So at least I'm comfortable with one aspect of it and learning to get comfortable with the second now. Now, as far as WWF, how did you originally, like or when you back hit, let's say, 1993, how did you actually get into the world, the crazy world of wrestling? Well, uh, both Vince and Linda McMahon were fans of the radio show and listened to the show. And I got a call out of the blue. Um, I think Linda called first and said, you know, Vince and I were talking and we, we love what you do on the radio. Do you have any interest in, you know, wrestling? And I said, well, I really don't watch a lot of wrestling. And, and then Vince said, well, that's perfect because I want somebody with an outside perspective. I just want somebody new who's a fan with a microphone, right? So I said, yeah, I can do that. So it all stemmed from the radio show. And then I went for the audition in Stanford and uh, was lucky enough to get the gig. So I did both, obviously, at the same time doing the radio show. And then after that, three days a week, I would go to Stanford uh record and come back and repeat that cycle and then add in the uh, pay-per-view so it was uh it was a busy five years was he a big fan of the prank phone calls like i was a big fan of the prank phone calls did he ever mention i think that? he liked them yeah i think he liked them <laughs> i actually did one on the macho man um many years later uh so yeah i, I think he they enjoyed the show listen that's how the contact happened uh so it that it did open that door which was nice but um it just a great experience. What was the phone scam on the Macho Man? Um, I I didn't do it. I, I wrote it and then had a buddy do it because he would have recognized my voice oh, immediately. Yeah. But we just said it was a super fan who got his phone number <laughs> by some chance out of the blue and just was asking ridiculous questions. And to his credit, he stayed on the phone. <laughs> he answered the questions. And then he said, all right, brother, when you hang up, lose the number. Don't ever call me again. <laughs> It's hysterical. That's awesome. That's great. I, I can't remember the exact story, but there is a great story you had out there about uh, something with Vince in the bathroom. Like, I can't remember, but I remember it was a very, very funny story as far as you know Vince and hearing you in the bathroom. Yeah, well, I after the interview process, I went to the bathroom and uh, somebody walked in while I was in another stall and proceeded to uh, do a little damage. So uh, I asked for a courtesy flush next door. You know, can we get a courtesy flush here? You know, I imagine all those protein bars. I didn't know who it was, <laughs> but all I did was hear him laugh. Uh, and he said, yeah, I think this is going to work out. Nice. So Vince liked that kind of humor. Yeah. I mean, he was, he certainly was, maybe he thought I knew it was him. Uh, I can't tell you a hundred percent. If I did, would I have said that? Eh, probably not, but I guess it was good that I didn't know it was him and i i said it and I, oh give me a courtesy flush god <laughs> and he left that's great though he's got a great sense of humor that he, he doesn't realize i guess no he definitely does he's a very funny guy how would he behind the scenes because you know fans you know me myself included of course it's always like oh i always hear he's a horror story but you're saying he's funny he's got a great sense of humor how is he behind the scenes yeah i never experienced any of that uh he was always genuine he was always um, helpful, affable. Um, I, I didn't, 
I didn't get any of the, he's a nightmare. Here, here's a guy who's taken a regional business to a multi-billion dollar property. You know, you, you have to make business decisions when you, when, you, when you do that. So I guess maybe that rubs some people wrong, but I always respected that. And he, if, he, if he had to correct you, he did it politely. He did it professionally. But that was his job. I mean, he was the boss. So to me, it was, it was always constructive. And it came from a place of, hey, wanting the product to get better. So I never had a problem with it, never had words, never saw him ever yell at anyone. He was a, a soft-spoken guy. Um, you know, he was just very chill. I mean, that that was him and still is, you know. I mean, I, I haven't worked with him in a number of years, but just from the people I still talk to, yeah, Vince is the same. But, you know, you get a reputation, right? If, if, if you say something to somebody and they repeat it, maybe not quite in context, that's how that stuff starts. So I, I, I just never saw any of that at all. He was always great with me. Have you been able to stay in contact with him over the years? Uh, we exchanged emails for a little while, but that, that's about it. I mean, what am I going to bother? Hey, how you doing? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm running a business. How you doing? You know what I mean? So um, it, it, we stayed in touch when it when it made sense. For, you know, working for Vince, obviously there is the other side, the production side, the Kevin Dunn side, where he's the executive producer, the EVP of TV. He's running things. How is he? Because he doesn't do interviews. He You know, he's kind of a guarded guy. How is Kevin? Kevin's terrific. And uh, I guess if you or I were responsible for content for 130 countries every week, we probably wouldn't do interviews either because he doesn't have any time. I don't know how he does it, to be honest. Uh, I really don't because it's he actually produced Mania for, for quite some time. And then, you know, if somebody was out or sick, he had to jump in. So he would jump in and produce. Uh, he may have done that initially when I started just to make sure I wasn't going to wreck everything. Uh, but we, we became very good friends and, um, Kevin and I used to talk a lot again, we haven't over these years, but, um, I also know that if I, I needed to talk to Kevin, I could pick up the phone and he would answer, which is, which is great. Um, but, but again, he's one of these guys that just had so much responsibility and the end product was magnificent right so kevin and i were were very good friends he was my boss obviously but we developed a friendship as well and uh, really respect uh, and admire kevin to me because i've had experience with him i actually have to talk to him once a year just for something that they purchased for me but not neither here nor there but he's been nothing but a a nice guy so like oh, yeah. He always thoughtful what he, what he says back to you like very seems like a really nice guy but nobody really knows he's like that voice of god he's just kind of right he's there his presence is there but nobody really talks to him too much and that's an example of what we talked about earlier with social media now people really well why doesn't he do interviews well, back in the day nobody thought that because they didn't he was a behind the scenes guy right and and responsible for all of the the content but now they're like, oh, he doesn't do interviews. We don't know about this guy. Let's find out about this guy. So that's how the world has changed. He's happy avoiding the, the limelight and just doing his gig. Totally happy. I know Stone Cold Steve Austin keeps trying to get him on, you know, his podcast and stuff. And he, I know he just won't do it, which is funny. If Austin can't get him, nobody's getting this guy to do it. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Now, as far as you and, and starting, what do they say like your role is going to be? Hey, we want you hosting Mania. We want you doing, you know, Blast Off. We want like what, the Action Zone and, and Livewire. Like, what do they say to you like when you first start? Uh, when, it, when it first started, it was for Mania and pay-per-views, right? And then it just sort of grew when, when they introduced these new shows. Um, I mean, I was on the first Raw. Um, you know, that's pretty fun to say and think back the very first one when it's become, you know, such an iconic show. Um, I mean, I hosted shows with the macho man, uh, Ted DiBiase, Doc Hendricks, Sonny, um, so many people. And there were, boy, I, I think I hosted maybe six or seven shows plus 
the countdown shows and interviews on the pay-per-views. And it was just, it wasn't a lot of, hey, l l let's just have Todd do this. You know, I, I think it was, I mean, it, that's what it was. It wasn't a lot of thinking, well, what do we do? Let's have Todd do this. I, I don't think it was designed for me, but I was available. A lot of the other guys were on the road, right? So they, they were traveling a lot of the time and I was home-based. So it was certainly easier for me to do a live Sunday morning call-in show uh, being you know, an hour away than it would be to try to bring in talent who was out on the road and doing shows. So I think a lot of it, although I'd like to believe it was based on talent, was based on my proximity to the studio. And you kind of replaced Sean Mooney in essence, right? I mean, that role, is that what they told you? Hey, we're, we're getting rid of Sean Mooney. We need you to be that way. Or they say, just, we want you to be the way you are. And you're, you know, you're Todd, just be Todd. Yeah. No one ever told me uh, how to act, what to say what to do. They gave me the information and said, be you and do it in your style, which I appreciated. I'm not sure I would have been able to do it if I was playing a role. Um, I was just a ham and egger and, you know, did the best I, that I could do. What was it like being a part of that first role? Because when it's going on, you're probably thinking like, oh, who knows if it's going to last 30 years later, looking back, it's like, wow, what an iconic thing to be a part of the first role and really be on the ground floor at the start of it. Yeah, we had no idea, clearly. You always hope, <clears throat> excuse me, that a show is going to do well. But, you know, you never know. There were other shows that I did, you know, Action Zone and then Superstars and uh, Challenge, uh, Mania, that didn't last for that long. So you, you never know what's going to connect and what's going to hit. But that was, we did it at the uh, Manhattan Center, was the very first one. So... Again, my radio studio was at Madison Square Garden. So there, I, I was literally a block and a half away. So, so I would just grab a hotel room, you know, not go back to Jersey, but grab a hotel room, do raw, stay over, do the radio show the next morning. But it, it was it was nothing that we we thought, or at least I thought at the time, was oh, this show's gonna be on 30 years. Um, and and be, you know really a pop culture phenomenon, um, had no idea, but was really happy to be a part of it. Even when I didn't know that, cause the energy there was, was just amazing. And you knew it was something different, you know, because number one, it was at night. Um, I'm trying to think if that first show was, it might've been like an 11 o'clock show, but I, I, my memory is a little foggy of it. With the guys that are on it, you know, you look back like the Macho Mans of the world, the Bobby the Brain Heenans. These are the guys, you know, I grew up on that are literally larger than life. When you're working with them, are you thinking like these guys are legends or are you thinking equals as far as like working with them as talents? I'm not thinking equal. I'm not thinking legend. I'm thinking, you know, broadcast partner at this point, right? And still that they know way more than I do about this business. So leaning on them and setting them up the best I could. Um, when you're, if you're, if you're working on camera and you're starstruck, you're dead because you're not going to be able to do anything. And you also have to remember that I was not a massive wrestling fan. So although I've heard of these guys, they weren't part of my childhood, which, which may have been good in that I didn't go into it with, you know, that sort of awe inspiring, aura around these guys and and they were all terrific but radio also really helped with that because anyone who came through any celebrity you know we we're in manhattan so new york's the number one market in the country so we we talked to everyone you know i mean elton john and angelina jolie and i mean anyone you could imagine had been through and we we just looked at it as a gig right it was a job and they're here to promote something and and the same thing is true when you're doing um, when you're doing a television show. You know, your job as the guy with the microphone is to make it work, and that's all I tried to do. On the <clears throat> flip side, do they look at you like, wow, you're the uh, you know very popular DJ in the biggest market in the world, like you just said? Do they look at you like, okay, this guy's instant credibility. He's going to have the, his audience kind of move over. Do they look at you like, you know, as a big star as well? Is there like an equal playing field? I don't know. You'd have to ask them, but I, I never considered myself 
a celebrity. Um, I, I just didn't look at it that way. I I was, you know, on the radio, I I was more of a comic, you know, and and basically was doing stand up on the radio as best you can um, when you still have to play songs and stuff. So I, I think some of them may have said this guy knows nothing about wrestling. What the hell is he doing here? And others said. Oh, this is good for us. It expands the brand. So, you know, everybody has an opinion. Um, I can tell you that there was never a crossword spoken in the entire time I was there from anyone, which I think I can't say that about radio. Uh, I can't. We had battles and would fight it's still, you, you know, you love each other. But maybe that was because I I wasn't doing the road 300 days out of the year. Because, you know, you work with somebody, obviously you're going to have arguments. But but we never, I never felt bad about going in. You know, there, there are points in your life, and I'm sure this has happened to you, at your job or people watching or listening, where you sort of dread going in. Like, oh, I got to deal with Larry. Oh, Larry again every day makes me feel like garbage. I got to go in. And that's your job, right? So you have to do it. Never had that feeling Um when I was working there, it was just always fun. It was a lot of work. I mean, I was tired at the end of the day, but the people make the product. And that's so obvious because it's still going so strong this many years later. I meant to ask you this before, but I wasn't sure. Did you actually have to try out for Vince? Or did they, you got the job because he knew you from PLJ? Like, oh, you're automatically in. Uh, well, I went for... For an audition, um, I think he wanted to make sure I was at least competent, um, you know, on camera. Yeah. <laughs> he, he heard the audio part. But, yeah, I, I was – when you interview for Vince, you're either given a broom or a bottle of water to sell, right? So I was given the bottle of water. And it was just like, all right, sell me this. Talk for two minutes. Go. Um, and a lot of people get the broom. A lot of people get the water bottle. That's how it went. So basically, it's like a, the old salesman technique. It's like, sell me this, that you're going to be a quote-unquote salesman on the air for me, and we want to see how you react to it. Sure, and how you do for two minutes. Like, uh, the, again, the thing I think that radio helped with is you can't not talk, right? Because then there's dead air. And there's nothing to do. So the same applies for television. You have somebody in your ear saying, all right, 30 seconds, and we're going to throw to this package. So... You'd start your wind up and then you'd hear him say, tape's not ready, fill for a minute. So you'd start another story and then they'd say, all right, we're ready, five, four. So you have to adjust and as you're speaking, listen to someone talk in your ear, which I was sort of used to, not the ear talking, but having to hit a time. Because uh, when I first started in radio, you know, we just have to back time the network news um, and all that stuff. So it, it, it just was a great training ground for television i think radio was an invaluable part of that so when they bring you in you do get hired obviously you sell that bottle of water you like crazy he, lo he loves you you know do they say hey well you're kind of going to be the voice in the face of this new generation does that like, ever come, be brought up to you no no it's never said um it, it's just a gig and let's see how it goes and we're going to start you on a a show called Mania, new show, Saturday mornings. I said, great, man, I'm, I'm off. Let's go. Let's see where it goes. And then it just, they gave me more and more and more and more, which I was happy to do. You know, it's more exposure. It's more experience. So, yeah, it was never spoken that, you know, you're going to be the face of anything, except it's that's your face and we'll do the best we can with it. Did you ever get a sense like, okay, we're moving into this new, quote unquote, new generation, era, but really a new era getting away from the Hulk Hogan era, you know, getting away from like that quote unquote golden era. Did you ever get a sense like, oh, we're getting, we're, you know, we're changing the business right now? Oh, without question. Uh, I mean, there was, uh, and you remember I, I, just as I left the attitude era sort of, you know, was, was getting going, but yeah, that new generation and, and, you know, there were competing wrestling organizations. There was a uh, back and forth with that. But you definitely knew that the business was changing. And it has to, right? We talked about that earlier. Every business has to evolve. If you're not moving forward, you're going backward. 
So to Vince's credit, he was always evolving things from the characters. I mean, you take Goldust. It's a perfect example. If you had a character like Goldust now, no one would blink an eye. 20 years ago, that was a major deal. And, and because Vince is a visionary, he was able to pull that off. And, and those are the kind of things that evolved. And he did it with the entire brand. And he continues to do it. And if you don't, you're just stagnant, right? There's just nowhere to go if you don't keep reinventing yourself. What did you think of the new generation era? Because it was a lot of, let's say, cartoon stuff, you know, with the the Kiss My Foot match or like the TL Hopper is the, is the plumber, you know, like everybody had a craft and the goon. Like, what did you kind of think of, of that era? Well, you remember it, right? You remember all the specific, and that's the, that's the truest test. Is it memorable? Will it stick? Does it work? And it did. Um, a lot of people may not have liked it, but it worked. And it especially worked for me because it was just, there was so much room for comedy and, and levity and not taking yourself too seriously, which, which I think everyone needed at that time. And it, it, it hold, it, it held its own, you know, it, it, it really did. And, and the fact that in your house, which was part of that is being brought back, you know, as a takeover, I think says a lot about the new generation. It's funny, like looking back, it's like, but these guys are giving away a house. Obviously WCW at that point had the class of the champions, but then they started doing every, almost every month they were starting to do pay-per-view. So WWF kind of counteracted like, all right, we'll do two hour in your house pay-per-views, but also Stephanie, Hawaiian, and you were going to give away a house. What did you kind of think of that in theory? It's like, wait a second, what the hell is going on? They're giving away a house. What? P pretty amazing, right? I yeah. mean, and the logistics of giving away a house on live television are also fairly mind blowing. Um, I remember that, you know, the call didn't go through when you have to do it again, but you have to fill and you have to make it entertaining. And then, it, you know, a kid winds up winning it. Um, and I think it was Johnny Gargano that said that. That house is now a Taco Bell. Did you know that? No, really? Wow. Yeah. I think I think that was big news. I, and I'm pretty sure Johnny was the one who mentioned that. Wow, I did not know that. That's so funny. Like, but just in theory, it's like they're giving, giving away, away houses. House? Yeah. The WWF, World Wrestling Federation. You know what I mean? Like it just kind of doesn't yeah. make sense in a in a certain way. But how compelling, right? How amazing. And then to have a kid win it, Matt yep. Pompicelli. <laughs> um, when I was talking to him, I was like, this, he doesn't sound like, he sounds like he's a kid. Am I allowed to give a house to a kid? <laughs> you know, but I just kept going and did my thing and, you know, he won a house. Is anybody in your ear, like on, on the little, uh, you know, the little adapter saying, Hey, uh, can't give a kid a house or, or just keep going. Nope. Is any, but, nope. No, All everybody you? was quiet. As a matter of fact, when I, after the show, I, I was sitting with Kevin and I was like, dude, I, I expected you to, you know, say something in my ear. You can't give a kid a house or, but Kevin would rib you along the way too. Cause he was always in your ear for pay-per-views. It was always Kevin. It was no one else. I never remember him missing a pay-per-view. And so his voice just became part of the whole experience. And, you know, he would say things as I was going, normally it's countdowns and where you're going and you're trying to remember, but he would you know, as I'm saying something, Oh God, that was awful. <laughs> uh, you know, and so we rib each other, you know, and it, it, it was, it was really, it was really fun and made it entertaining. And I said, dude, you let me give a house to a kid. Goes, well, the rules are the rules. What, what was I supposed to say? He <laughs> said, I just wanted to see how you'd react because he's always talking and this, and it was dead quiet. So I just, you just keep going, right? If no one tells you, you have to get a rap in your ear if they say, all right, Todd, you know, start wrapping it up. We're going to go to it in 45 seconds. There was nothing. I'm talking to this kid who's screaming his head off. And, you know, his voice hadn't even changed yet. And I'm like, where is Kevin? Where is Kevin? Where is Kevin? But yeah, it, live TV, man. Whatever happens, happens. I love that he's like razzing you and stuff and, and in your ear while you're trying to conduct a live show. It, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't any major at any point, but, uh, you know, if I would, I'd call someone, right. And it wouldn't go through. And then 
I have to redial. I'm, all right, I'm going to redial. Let's see if we can get. And I hear in my head, this is going really well. It was funny. It yeah. broke it. And it, he did it purposefully because it was an icebreaker. He was like, whatever it is, dude, just roll. You know, don't worry about it. And that, again, goes back to that whole radio thing where you just go. There's there's no let's do it again. It's happening live. So you whatever happens, happens, you know. And I'm sure from radio, you're used to people being in your ear like, hey, we're going to commercial or whatever. You know, you're used to it. Well, in the ear is is not so much a radio thing. Um, it's all hand signals. So, you know, this is 30 seconds. This is 15 um, so it was more visual for the producer. Um, but with television, you know, I had the IFB and would hear, you know, everything going on and, and sometimes they'd leave it open and I'd hear directions to other people and Kevin come back. Oh, sorry. Hit your button <laughs> off, you know, but you got to keep going, man. You got to keep going. And nowadays, I don't know, it's probably not really for you, but nowadays they always say, oh, everything's so scripted with the announcers. And they, they, you know, it seemed much better back then when you can kind of be your own self. Like there's no, no like, like you said, no playing a character, no script. There might be bullet points, but there's no script. It seems like that is better because you get to be Todd Pettengill. You know what I mean? You get to be who you are. It certainly was better for me. Um, I mean, I've done shows where they were all scripted and, you know, you stayed with it and that's fine too. But I think it lent credibility to that whole era in that it was just happening before you. And I, I think it was the same for the superstars as well, who would, you know, they'd have their bullet points too. But, you know, you're going to tell Shawn Michaels or Bret Hart to, to read a script? No, they're not going to do that. You know, they're going to put it in their own words and they're going to sell it to their fans the best way they can and hit whatever points they need to hit. But other than that, they're just going to be a genuine person. You know? As far as Michaels and Brad, obviously, you know, the stories are out there. They have so many backstage problems. There was just a documentary with HBK. He was talking about all the problems with Brett. There's going to be one um, with Brett as well. What did you kind of think backstage of like that dynamic? Like, wow, these guys really you know, don't like each other. Or, or do you think, oh, these guys must be working because they're wrestlers? Well, we, we knew that they didn't necessarily – uh, join each other's fan clubs. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of that, right. In, in sports and entertainment where you work with someone who is not necessarily your best friend or you don't socialize with, but you make it work professionally. Um, we weren't really privy to a lot of, you know, it was the guys hung out and the production team hung out. There was, there wasn't a lot of mingling, uh, you know, backstage because it was, it was a kayfabe, you know, situation where, I didn't want to really know uh, any of that stuff. And I didn't see a lot of it, probably because I wasn't in a position to. Um, when I was at a pay-per-view, I was generally running around the arena. So there wasn't a lot of downtime to sort of see that stuff. And, and I didn't travel with those guys, right? So I wasn't on the road where I think people who did may have seen more of that. But I, I just wasn't. It was never in my mind when I was there. I was just thinking about what I was doing and how to do it the best way I could. And uh, both of those guys were were great on camera. Um, they they could sell like nobody's business. Um, and just I I think unparalleled. I mean, uh, I used to love interviewing Sean. He you'd always get something. Uh, you know, he put his arm around you. You know, it was loose. It was casual. It was believable which i think is is what made it work what did you think about him behind the scenes was he ever like a, a problem or anything or was he ever difficult or he was easy no not to me i mean again i can only tell you how how it was with me uh but i never i never had hey man you know that and that's all it was i mean i wasn't hanging out with him we weren't playing cards we weren't you, you know what i mean so yeah. my my sort of off camera time with those guys was limited um, so anything I saw was just, uh, uh, you know, on camera basically. And, and it was great. How was Brett? Was he all business or was he kind of loose and casual like HBK? No, Brett was more business. Uh, there's no question. Uh, but Brett would do things like, come here. I want to tell you something. And you know, this would be backstage off. How you doing? You know? So it was, it was more, he was a, 
softer spoken guy, but you talk about an amazing champion. I mean, Bret Hart may have been one of the greatest champions ever. Um, he carried the belt differently than Sean carried the belt, uh, but they all do, right? I mean, every superstar has their own way of handling things. And I know Sean has said he thought maybe he was immature, didn't handle things properly, but I thought it was refreshing, especially when you had, you know, the juxtaposition of Brett to Sean, uh, very different champions, but that's good. You know, I mean, you don't want the same guy to act like the other guy. I mean, what, what, what point would there be to that? And Brett to a lot of people is kind of the face of the new generation era. If let's say if you're the voice, he's kind of the face of it for a while. That, that, that like real <clears throat> champion, you know what I mean? Like that real wrestling champion. He takes the business yeah. very seriously. He, he, you know, he's, he's not going to be fooling around or joking around or, or dancing and stuff like that. I mean, he was kind of like that. Hey, this happened over here. Maybe some controversies happened, but now we have a champion, like a wrestler champion. Yeah. And the, obviously the family legacy, you know, of, of the Hart family. Uh, and it was real and he carried it like that. And then, you know, when we got into the, the issues with Brett and Owen, I mean, they were some of the most classic interviews, I think, and storylines that still would hold up if you were to go back and watch. I love it. And it was at WrestleMania 10. I love that show. That was uh, quite an experience. Being at WrestleMania, is that pretty cool? I know you really started WrestleMania 9 was your first WrestleMania, but was that a cool experience? Like witnessing like like the grand stage of the WWF, but this is their big, big show. Yeah, the pageantry, you know, the celebrity um, was very cool. But, but they approached every pay-per-view as if it were WrestleMania. Now, WrestleMania was an added pressure to perform because you knew it was the main stage, right? It was the World Series. It was the Super Bowl. It was the top of the mountain in the game. So that was that was the big one. But I'll tell you, when, when the preparations kicked in, they were the same for every pay-per-view. He, he paid, Vince paid attention to every minute detail, like every other pay-per-view was WrestleMania. But, uh, you know, I enjoyed 10 because, you know, the, well, I enjoyed nine as, as well but in, in the toga, but it was a little different that I, that I didn't have to do that. <laughs> um, you know, 10 was a little bit different. You liked hanging out with uh, Burt Reynolds at WrestleMania 10. Yeah, well, I think Lonnie Anderson, was it, was yep. it uh, Pam Anderson? Pam Anderson. Um, I worked with Lonnie Anderson a lot on the radio, but... Uh, Pam and the whole dressing room bit. I don't know if you remember that, but, but mm -hmm. there was some classic, some classic moments. Hey, wouldn't you know, want mine work with her? You know, that's a no, good that person to work suck. with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. As far as kind of just at that time period in, in the WWF, Macho Man is kind of working his way out. But what was it like working with him? Because he's got to be, uh, eccentric like you said with that prank phone call he was cool he's great but he's also he could be a little paranoid but what's macho man like what was he like to work with back then amazing um always was prepared uh for the show he made me feel like an equal even though i knew i wasn't on that show we had a genuine friendship um you know when you host a show with someone you become closer and, and like i said there are people that that you'll work with over the years and you'll host a show together. The chemistry is not necessarily there, but you still make it work. It was there immediately with Randy and that's because of him. He allowed it to work. Um, you know, there are, there are guys who put in that position just wouldn't let it work or they would relegate me to a certain area and say, all right, you're going to deal with this. I'm going to handle this. He didn't do any of that. Uh, he was, the most engaging, magnanimous person uh, to work with. And uh, I miss him. He, he was a, a good friend. To me, he kind of, you know, embodies like a professional wrestler. When you think of like a wrestler, you know, a guy that can talk, a guy that has the look, a guy that like, if you turn on the TV, it's like, who is this guy? I'm keeping this on. Even snap into a Slim Jim. Like, just, it, it just embodies to me, like the typical, like what you think of when you think of a pro wrestler. I always think like the macho man, like the voice, the the, the talk. Everything yeah. is, is, is wrestling. It's, it's him. Yeah. And, and, you know, as he was sort of moving into the announcing bit and, and stepping away from the ring a little bit, um, 
he he was so good that but remember it was the macho man style so a lot of times you know I, if he was doing play by play for a pay-per-view or something and maybe he was with the king you know, i think it was probably vince randy and and jerry lawler uh they were a perfect foil because jerry lawler would be going, what did you just say I, what, are you, what are you talking about randy would would just go into his whole you know, oh, they're swinging from the rafters, even though there aren't rafters here. But if there were, they'd be swinging from them. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's that whole kind of. Yes. And you're like, what? But you're listening and you're going, yeah, he's he was engaging. And he had that gift of being able to bring you in where you felt like you knew him. Now, with social media, it's a completely different thing. And I don't know what life would have been like for a lot of these guys, if they had had access to social media, but their opportunity to connect happened in front of a box with a piece of glass on it. And they did it. And it was much harder to do than it is now with social media, because if you want to connect with people, you can, anyone can people that you don't want to connect with, you could connect with. But back then, you had to do the work, man. It was the camera, the microphone, and your personality. And that's how you had to make it work. And I think everybody does a Macho Man impression, right? Everyone is, ooh, yeah, dig it. Like, everyone has their own Macho yep. Man impression. Even you, of course, which is good. Yeah. Well, mine was is always more subdued because that's how, I mean, that's my favorite picture when he, when he caught me, you know, dressed as him uh, on Mania. Yeah. Um, and, and it was always, uh, it was quieter. It wasn't, wasn't over the top. It was down here. Uh, talk, uh, you know, let's do it, Todd. Let's go. Uh, Love so, it. Yeah. Love it. Who's like your all time kind of favorite guy? Because becoming like the backstage announcer, the backstage interviewer, is there a, a couple guys or guys that you just, I don't know, love working with more than others? Because it seemed like, you know, sometimes there's more chemistry with certain guys. Is there guys that you felt that with? Well, there were guys that you knew were always going to deliver and other guys that, you know, you have to help along a little bit. Um, and I think, you know, Sean definitely stone cold, um, were, were guys that just did it. Um, you know, one of the things I like to say is the guy holding the microphone is responsible for the interview, right? So if we do a segment and the interview was terrible, that's my fault because I, I'm the guy holding the stick, right? So it's my job. Otherwise, what am I doing there? They would just be there by themselves and they they do their spiel. But if an interview doesn't work, it's the guy holding the microphone. And then I also like to say, if they take the microphone from me, well, then you're on your own. There's nothing I can do about it because I've lost control, right? You, you've taken it, it's all on you. But if I'm holding it and it doesn't work, it's on me, not them. And And I think for the most part, we always got, our our bid out and we we made it happen but you know again if an interview didn't work if i'm talking to i don't even know who to who who would have been a tougher interview i think i think guys who, who didn't say much were harder and they didn't say much probably because that was their character too you know, I mean, Shawn Michaels was the heartbreak kid. He was going to be loose. He was going to be all over the place. But, you know, when, when you have a, a psycho Sid or somebody who's, it's going to be tougher. If I'm talking to Tatanka, it's going to be tougher than it is talking to Stone Cold Steve Austin. But that's character based. So that's when it's the guy with the microphone's job to make sure it works. Like Bastion Booger or something. You know, you're not going to get too much out of Bastion Booger for, for an interview. <laughs> Right, right. Who's somebody that you kind of maybe didn't get along with, uh, or maybe maybe not really didn't get along with, but you, you're just like, oh man, I gotta work. Like you said before, like Larry, I'm not working with Larry today as an example, but <laughs> like who, who's any guy that you was like, oh man, I kind of not that you had a problem, but you're like, man, he's he's he just we're not jiving or something, you know, a guy like that. Um, gosh, I think and, and I I think it was made up heat because uh, Razor Ramon always said, you know. Hey Chico, I do the mullet, um, but we, I don't. You know, I don't think you copy my look. I, I, that would be the closest to. He was a, a tougher interview, 
but that was because of his character, right? It was the machismo, the not supposed to say a lot. It's supposed to be action. So I, I really didn't, uh, there was no heat and there was nobody. I, I said, Oh God, I got to interview this guy. No, because it was, that was my job. You know, I was happy for it because otherwise, what am I doing there? You know what I mean? Just running around and you're going to complain when you get an interview. No, I tried to make everyone as, as good as I possibly could. And it wasn't on the guys. It was on me. I completely forgot about that mullet. What were you thinking about? <laughs> that was a sick mullet, man. That thing had its own zip code. You think Razor was really jealous? Oh, yeah. I mean, I had to flip. You know, that thing had so much going on. I was just a messenger on that thing. I just carried it around. It 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 would have had its own social media page uh, had we had it back then. That's funny though, with like the Razor Ramon stuff, because that they're like, oh, I, I pet and Gail maybe didn't get along with Scott Hall. Like that is kind of like not out there as a room, but it is kind of like maybe they didn't get along. Like the character wise, I like when they get you. You know what I mean? Like as far as a fan, like oh, they got me. Like like Terry Funk and Dusty Rhodes, like oh, they really don't hate each other. What? They, oh, they got me. Like that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, there was never any genuine heat, you know, and after, after the interview, he would laugh and say, you, you copied my look. You did, <laughs> you know, so there was no, if you want to call that heat, I mean, sure. Okay. Now, as far as like the voiceover stuff, because I wanted to talk to you about that. That is the stuff that I remember uh, like so much uh, just fondly. And, and that's some stuff I remember the most. You were awesome at those voiceovers. Sometimes they do the black and white videos and then you give your serious voice and then it would pump up and it go color and you'd kind of get more into it. Were you always just good at, at the voiceovers? Because some people can do them and some people, you know, not that greatly. I mean, you were like one of the best at it. I feel like perfect for that era, but also great just because you made the match seem much, much more important. I loved, I love doing voiceovers. Um, you know, it's my, you know, it's how I started and you can paint such a picture with words. And then when you have the picture, you know, it's just, you have to work that much harder to match the image, right? Because if you're just doing a voiceover without picture, you're selling it and, and you have to create what people are picturing in their minds and no two people will picture the same thing. But when you have picture to go with it, you have to match the intensity of what you're seeing. So I, I love starting out, you know, with the drama and then you build to the hype. Um, yeah, it's just always been a passion of mine and I, I still love doing them. I saw someone online was saying, I don't know about video packages. And I'm thinking to myself, video package, that's like the key in wrestling to me of really getting the story over that's important. Because even Brett Owen, you're like very somber. You're like, these brothers do not want to wrestle. And then you're like, cut to Brett. I don't, will never under any circumstances wrestle my brother. And, you know, and then you, like, you, it, they're so important. They're so key. They add to the show. Oh, I lot. agree. Absolutely true. Is there any voiceover that you just were like, oh man, I love, I love like doing, like this Bret Hart Owen Hart match, or is there one that sticks out? Those were great. I mean, those those pieces were great. I remember, again, it's you know we're talking a lot of years ago, but I remember the the one package, and I, and I said something like, you know, the brotherhood will be tested forever, you know, and and it's Owen like, all you had to do was tag me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, and I get goosebumps thinking about it now because it's still right. It paints that picture. And it was, I it was amazing. And even as a fan, it's like you put everything together in context and it makes the match that's about to come or, right. or you know, the makes it so much more important. Like, Oh my God, it puts it some music and something behind it. It's like, and Todd's voice. It's like, man, he, they're really, this is really, really important. Like this is, this is the most important thing right now is this match, right? The pageantry, the setup, the buildup, because we all know sometimes the buildup is better than the actual thing. <laughs> you yes. know, a lot of people have relationships like that. I used to say, oh, I used to look forward to having company so much and you'd prepare and you'd get ready and then your company would come and you'd be like this. When do you guys leave? You know, the buildup <laughs> is, is, is the best part. I agree. I, I totally agree. Now, as we hit the wind down, head towards the finish. Why did you end up leaving the, the WWF in 1997? It was just too too much, or yeah. Well, I, I basically once they started the monthly pay per views and I did all that, I didn't have a vacation in about six years. Um, so I was doing the radio nonstop. I remember, I was getting up at 2:30, 2:45 in the morning 
uh, five days a week and then doing, you know, three days in Stanford back and forth and then a pay-per-view once or twice a month. It just, it just was too much. I could not do both physically anymore. Um, and that's all it was. I, I had a talk with Kevin and I said, look, man, I'd love to, I just can't, I can't physically do it anymore. And my wife wants to go on a vacation, <laughs> you know? So it, it that's, that's all it was. It, it was on great terms that we left and there was no, no problem, obviously, since they, you know, bring me back from time to time and do stuff. And I think, you know, bringing Michael in helped a lot. And, you know, I, I tried to make it as smooth of a transition as it could possibly be. When, you know, you're having that hectic day, is that literally like all day you're working like, you know, 16 hour day because you got your radio gig, you got WBF. I mean, is that what it and traveling between? I mean, is that literally the whole day is work, work, work? Pretty much. Um, yeah. I mean, with television, there's a little more hurry up and wait than there is with radio, right? Because you have yep. to wait, and then the lights need to be set, and then, oh, this guy needs to do this, or this pointer, then there's a camera problem. But yeah, it was, the problem with the whole thing was I loved it, and that always doesn't make a great marriage when you love work, and you're happy to work 16 hours. Uh, I did, I loved it, but I understand, you know, and I went, oh yeah, you know, and I'm, I had a little kid at that point, you know, my, my youngest or my oldest now, but my only then Amanda. Um, and you know, I was missing a lot. So it was one of those things where yeah, I, I thrive on work. I just absolutely love it. And I can't imagine ever fully retiring. I would be bored out of my mind. Um, so it, it was just one of those things. It, it was, it was probably time and even better that you know, they were sort of switching, you know, to the attitude era and the, you know, maybe, maybe this will be a good time to, you know, make a change and, uh, have a vacation and get a little sleep. It's funny. Cause like the golden era, the Hogan era kind of ends, you come in new generation era, Austin stunners, McMahon attitude era, you know, it's like you're literally a new generation. Like that's your yeah. time period. You fit it literally fit in there perfectly. It's true. It's true. It, it's it's funny. It's like, what do you fit in with the golden era? Probably. What do you fit in the attitude era? Probably. But it just fit perfectly in with it with the the new generation. Yeah, it was fun. It was a great ride, and and now I'm looking forward to to something new. You know, who knows? Let let's see if uh, if I can still make it happen. Who knows? What are your plans for the future? Do you think that you want to do more with wrestling? Is is this maybe just I the would NXT love to. takeover special or more? Yeah, I mean, I would love to if the opportunity arises and they they need me for something. I mean, I'm certainly open to it. Um, it's fun. I enjoy it. Uh, I think everybody is ready for a little live entertainment again. Uh, we've been starved, you know, the last year and a half through no fault of our own, obviously. But I think people want this more than ever. And you're going to see fans come out to not only wrestling, but I think every event fired up. And <laughs> I, I think the crowds are going to be pretty crazy for a while. Do you just have a favorite moment in wrestling? Something that, that sticks out above everything else that you did in, in the wrestling business? Well, I mean, it's hard to beat standing in the middle of the ring at Madison Square Garden, the world's most famous arena kind of difficult to beat um being on board the intrepid uh, oh yeah for the on, on fourth of july when it was 300 degrees and i literally mean that it was 100 and then with the heat coming off of that ship it was unbelievable but that the pageantry of of that event was was amazing uh, i mean there's a lot of moments but you know i think those are those are probably two of the top I mean, riding a horse, I think that was in San Antonio. Uh, in, in the, I've done some pretty wild things, actually. Definitely, definitely did. As far as, as wrestling, look about it, like when you look back, all fond memories, all, all good times in the business? All good. I mean, I, I really I think there was one trip where it might have been Syracuse where – I got to the hotel and my hotel room didn't have a door. It, the door wasn't broken. 
it just didn't have one. Whoa. <laughs> that, yeah, that was one that I, I called down to the, I remember calling at the desk and I, you know, I'd worked all day and I didn't check in until late and I said, yeah, hello. Yeah, I'm in uh, 617, I think. I, there's no door. <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah, they were painting it. They didn't put it. I said, no, I'm going to need a door if I'm going to stay in this room. Oh, my God. And that was the only thing that I said, what the hell is going on on this trip? But, you know, it's a fond memory now as you look back. But, man, after you worked all day, you flew that morning, you want to get back, and you just you get to your room, and it's just there. It's open. It's like... <laughs> I guess this is me. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. And of course, you'll be a part of NXT TakeOver in your house coming up Sunday on Peacock for everybody yep. out there. But where can everybody get you and see you and all your social media and what else do you got? Whatever else you got going on. I just do uh, Instagram. So it's just Todd Pettengill on Instagram. I don't, uh, when I did the radio, I used to do Facebook and all the other, but, but at this point, I'm just focused on Instagram. So. You can find me there. What is just Todd Pattingill? Yeah. Nice. Awesome stuff. Looking forward to seeing you on NXT again. It's always great to have you associated with the WWF, WWE, and in your house. Mr. Pattingill, thank you so much. Been an honor. Thanks for having me on, brother. And continued good luck with the show. I appreciate it.